Hey, I'm Will Malone, and I shoot a lot of in-camera double exposures. But today we're not going to talk about double exposures. Today we're going to talk about the principles of photography that got me to this photo. And there are a lot of principles of photography that got me to this photo, but today we're only going to talk about one, shutter speed. Understanding shutter speed is pretty simple overall if we cut it into two sections. So let's start with the first one. Now I shot these photos a few years ago when we first moved into our house. And my intent behind these photos was basically to create some artwork for my kitchen. And I never actually used them for my kitchen. I just ended up using one of my Fakoe shots. But it was good practice when thinking about freezing objects in a poorly lit room. Now you may notice when you switch the dial to the S on your camera, which stands for shutter priority, that you can go up and down in your shutter and it'll change the aperture for you because you're just focused on shutter speed. Now, when you do that and you go up to, I don't know, on film cameras, sometimes the maximum is one one thousandth of a second. Uh, on a digital camera, it may go all the way up to one eight thousandth of a second. Now, when you go to those speeds on a camera, that's really fast. So, so when the shutter clicks, it clicks super quick. And what do you see oftentimes? Nothing. It's dark. And that's because the shutter is going so quickly, it's not letting a lot of light into the camera. So for these photos, I had to use one of these, which is a flash. Uh, and we're not going to talk about flash photography today, but I use this Nikon speed light in order to blast tons of light into my dark kitchen in order to freeze the motion of these fruits and vegetables splashing into water. In order to do that, I had to use a fast shutter speed so there's no blurriness in the photo, but then I had to at the same time have a lot of light in there. So for those of you that photograph sports, I've never been really into photographing sports, but you know that if you're out shooting a game, you want a fast shutter speed so you can freeze the motion of the players. And a lot of time it's pretty easy to do that because they're outdoors in a stadium where natural sunlight is flooding in. But if you're inside a house, dark space, whatever, you're gonna need some extra light to do that, to get your shutter speed that fast. And so we go back to the double exposure at the beginning of the video. So for the first shot, I shot a portrait of my wife and I used a faster shutter speed as to not have any blurriness in the frame. I wasn't using one one thousandth of a second shutter speed, but I was using about one fiftieth or one twenty fifth of a second. And I needed light from a lamp in order to make sure there was no blurriness in her swaying movements or if she moved a little bit, that I could freeze her in time. Okay, so we talked about fast shutter speed. Now let's talk about slow shutter speed. Now there's a lot of examples of this, but a hallmark of slow shutter speed is blurriness, streaks, lines, because you're not freezing something in time. You're letting it kind of move through time in slow motion and you tend to capture that. So now when you, th when you think of slow shutter speed, you may think of a photo like this, which is basically where somebody slows down their shutter to a second or even longer. Remember, our, the first photos we looked at were a fraction of a second. Now we're going down to maybe a second, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds in order to get a long drawn out movement of something. So you've seen a lot of these. These are, this is traffic. This is car headlights and brake lights moving down a road through time. Now, if I shot a photo of a car moving down a road at a super fast shutter speed, you would just see the car frozen in the middle of the road. Now, if I'm shooting at a lower shutter speed of like a second or 10 seconds, you're going to see these streaks of the headlights, this red and white color moving down the road because your shutter's just open, just taking in whatever is coming in for a long period of time. Now, this is different from fast shutter speed in that when you fire off your shutter at a very fast rate, you're not letting in a lot of light in your camera. Well, when you leave your shutter open for a long amount of time, you're letting in a lot of light in your camera. And this usually isn't a problem when you're shooting at night. So when you're shooting traffic, when you're shooting something at dark, when you're light painting, for instance, you have enough darkness to where you're not just gonna blow out your frame because not many things are providing light. Usually in these kind of photos, the only things that are providing a lot of light are the headlights or the brake lights. Or if you wanna have fun and draw 
words. When I started photography years and years ago, I would often experiment with this technique of using slow shutter and trying to draw fun things with a flashlight or something like that. Now these photos aren't that good because it was my first couple years in photography, but it was a fun way to kind of learn the basics of how shutter speed works. Now another example of slow shutter photography is something that we've all seen all over the place, which is smooth, creamy waterfalls. Where the water moves like fabric off of a rock into a stream or river or whatever. And that requires a slow shutter speed. But oftentimes those photos are shot during the day. How does that work? If, if your shutter's just open and you're letting in tons of light, that doesn't matter at night because it's dark, right? But when it's daytime, and lights just flooded in, maybe it's noon, and you got a lot of light flooding in the frame. Well, you would think your frame's just gonna be white. You're not gonna be able to see anything. Well, that's why they make a fun little thing called a neutral density filter. Now, a neutral density filter is a filter that is basically sunglasses for your camera. Reduces the amount of light that you are allowing into your lens. And they're pretty cheap. This is a Tiffin uh, neutral density filter 0.9 and it cost about $23. But, but just the other day I went on a hike and I screwed this on my camera and got a photo of a smooth and silky waterfall. Now this 0.9 neutral density filter wasn't the darkest I could have gotten. In fact, I had to rely on closing my aperture down a little bit more, which we will talk about in a future video. We'll talk about the principles of aperture, but I had to do some work to make sure even less light was getting in to my, was getting onto my sensor for these photos. So, so this neutral density filter at the time of day I was shooting these photos wasn't quite enough and still had some blown out highlights in my photo. Okay. So the principles of shutter speed, if you want to shoot fast, you need a lot of light in order to freeze time. If you want to shoot slow, you need to reduce the amount of light that is coming into your camera in order to capture the slow movement of something without just totally blowing out your sensor. But thinking about these two different ways to use shutter speed really brings this photo into focus. For the first image of my wife, I wanted to freeze her in time. And there was a lot of light coming out of this lamp that I was using as a light source. So my shutter speed ended up being about 1 30th or 1 50th of a second something a little faster, something that wouldn't necessarily blur minor movements she made. And then in the second shot that was overlaid using my in-camera double exposure feature in my Fujifilm camera, I then attached my neutral density filter to reduce the amount of light going into my sensor. And I reduced my shutter speed to one tenth of a second. And then I asked her to sway back and forth. And when I did that, when I asked her to sway back and forth, suddenly there wasn't a lot of as much light being let into my lens. And so my slow shutter speed captured a blur rather than just freezing her in time or keeping her largely in shape. It just turned her into a blur for the second shot. So when these two photos are put together, it's made into this interesting and dramatic portrait that ends up being a photograph that has meaning. Not only does it help the imagination or the brain to wonder like what this photo is about, what is this photo trying to say, but it's also full of photography ideas and techniques. And in order to make a photo like this, there needs to be an understanding of how camera works and how photography works. So going forward, I wanna do more of these videos. I wanna give more photography tutorials from this angle. Basically, the way I learned photography, which is I would go out and find cool work. I would find cool photography from photographers that I really liked or really thought was beautiful or really meant something to me. And then I took those creative possibilities that I learned from those photographer artists and then learned photography techniques through that. I find that the way school often teaches photography or a lot of ways people teach photography is they start with talking about how to do all these things with a camera and then throw people to the wolves of trying to come up with creative ideas from there. But that's not how it works. We get into photography because there's something that interested us. There's some work we saw that meant a lot to us. There's some something we saw that made us want to pick up a camera and try to learn this stuff. And so I want to teach photography from a different angle, from creative first, and then we'll break it down into learning the different pieces of 
photography basics, the, the C scales, if you will. I think many of us probably learned piano when we were young, and at the same time, piano didn't stick. I learned piano, and I wasn't interested in it, because I got in there, and all we did was learn the C scales. We learned the da na 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 and you're sitting in a you know an old lady's living room, smells like mothballs, and it's just, there's nothing fun about that. But then when you look at people that stuck with music, you realize, oh, they heard a cool song, like the Foo Fighters or something like that, and they picked up a guitar, and they tried to learn those songs first and learning those songs were a trial by fire that taught them the basics along the way and so that's kind of how I look at learning photography and that's how I feel like all of this stuff aperture shutter speed all this stuff will actually stick in our minds is if we learn the fun ways it can be used rather than just learning them and then figuring out what to do with it later so I hope this was helpful uh Hit me in the comments with any feedback. This is kind of a new thing I'm doing. I'm, I'm going to try to come out with these every week. Uh, this will kind of be my Friday video. will be some sort of photography education thing. So uh, let me know what you think. Uh, go easy on me. This is my first time kind of delving into this in the, this way. But thanks for watching. You can follow me on Instagram at Will Malone. You can follow my Polaroid Instagram account at Everyday Instant. And I hope you got a lot out of this. And I'm excited to keep going with these. And I will see you soon. Face hugger.